Hey, it's Kenny again. In my previous video, I talked about why the economy of the Sung Dynasty thrived. But hold on tight, because in this video, we're diving into the flip side. We'll analyze why some people believe that the economy of the Sung Dynasty wasn't as prosperous as it seems. Get ready for a deep dive into the misconceptions and arguments surrounding this topic. Join me as we explore the intriguing reasons behind the differing opinions on the economic development of the Sung Dynasty. Stay tuned and let's uncover the truth together. Now, we're going to take a lighthearted and fascinating journey back to the Sung Dynasty and explore the quality of life for the people living in that era. You see, things weren't all rainbows and sunshine during this prosperous period in Chinese history. So, let's dive in and uncover the truth. To understand the quality of life in the Sung Dynasty, we first need to look at the population structure. The common folks were divided into two groups, those who owned land and those who didn't. And hey, don't forget the landowning peeps were further classified into five levels based on the amount of land they had. Now, here's the kicker, due to land annexation, a whopping 45% of the population found themselves without any land, while a mere 8% of the elite landlords owned a staggering 65% of the land. Talk about a wealth gap. Now, let's talk about prices because, hey, money makes the world go round, right? In the Sung Dynasty, prices experienced a significant jump after the Sung Sha War in 1040. Especially notorious was the ever-increasing tax imposed on monopolies. Living in the cities during this time was no piece of cake. In fact, you needed an annual income of a whopping 24,500 coins just to make ends meet. So, imagine this, a family of five, living in the city without any land, relying solely on their craftsmanship. How much money would they need to scrape by? Brace yourselves, because it's not pretty. Artisans and craftsmen struggled to make ends meet, earning an average daily income of around 50 coins, totaling approximately 18,300 coins annually. Yikes, talk about a tough gig. On the other hand, merchants and craftsmen working in the imperial armories fared relatively better. They enjoyed a higher daily income of over 100 coins, allowing them to maintain a more decent lifestyle. But hey, let's not forget about our beloved farmers who owned land. They were living the good life, with an annual income of 38,100 coins. These landowning farmers were the true middle class of ancient times, with their valuable land and property. However, for those unfortunate farmers without any land, life was a different story. Among them, those who had oxen and farming tools could only earn 60% of the income, while those without any oxen or tools could scrape by with just 50%. So, the annual income for these landless farmers would be around 20,000 coins, making life a real struggle. It's no wonder that the root of many ancient peasant uprisings lies within this group. Their income barely covered their monthly expenses, leaving them with no savings. In the face of natural disasters, they were unable to put food on the table. Rebellion was practically knocking on their door. So, here's the big takeaway, folks. When we look at the average GDP, it largely reflects the per capita output of those fortunate farmers who owned land. But let's not forget that 45% of the population in the Sung Dynasty, those without land, were not living the high life. They were struggling to reach the bare minimum, constantly fighting to make ends meet, with no savings to withstand natural disasters. The economy was booming, but hey, with great prosperity comes great price hikes. And unfortunately, it was the bottom tier folks who felt the pinch. So, let's explore the Sung Dynasty commerce and how it affected the everyday people. So, what exactly was the main business in the Sung Dynasty? Well, it was all about the essentials, my friends. Grain, salt, iron, tea, and booze. These merchants knew the key to success was catering to the strong consumer demand in the cities. They would buy grain and textiles from the rural areas and sell them in the urban markets. The transportation of goods was a moneymaker, and the laborers who moved the goods could earn a pretty penny. The government also collected taxes on these commercial transactions, and the merchants themselves raked in the big bucks. But guess what? All these costs ultimately found their way into the prices of grain and other goods. Ouch! Let's take a closer look at the price hikes over time, shall we? In the early years of the Northern Sung Dynasty, salt and tea were priced at a reasonable 50 coins 
coins and 70 coins per caddy, respectively. But fast forward to the mid-Northern Sung period, and those prices had jumped to 70 coins for salt and a whopping 100 coins for tea per caddy. And by the end of the Northern Sung dynasty, brace yourselves, folks, because salt was going for 100 coins per caddy, while tea had skyrocketed to a mind-boggling 160 coins per caddy. That's double the original price, my friends, and all within a span of roughly 160 years. Talk about inflation. Now, why did these prices soar to such heights? Well, it all boils down to the fact that the Sung Dynasty cities were packed with armies, officials, and landlords. With so much demand and purchasing power, commerce thrived. But here's the catch. Every link in the commercial chain wanted a piece of the pie, and their profits were reflected in the prices of goods. It's like a domino effect. My friends, more money for the transporters, higher taxes for the government, and bigger profits for the merchants. And guess who bears the brunt of it all? Yep, you guessed it, the common peeps. Now, why did the ancient emperors have a bone to pick with the merchants? Well, they believed that these savvy traders, with their buying and selling, were the root cause of price hikes and social unrest. They thought that these middlemen were just out to make a quick buck without considering the impact on the everyday folks. It's like the saying goes, with great commerce comes great price inflation. It may seem like the Sung Dynasty's finances were rolling in dough, but let me tell you, their financial situation was tighter than a corset at a royal ball. Picture this, it's the year when Emperor Yan Zhong ascended the throne, and guess what? Boom, a massive financial deficit hits the scene. The Sung Dynasty's biggest expenses were military and official salaries, and let's focus on Emperor Yan Zhong's reign to illustrate this. The combined spending on the military and officials accounted for a whopping 90% of the government's income. Talk about a heavy burden on the finances. Things took a turn for the worse during the Sung Dynasty when they went head-to-head -head with the Western Shah in a war. Not only did it cause a surge in prices, but it also led to increased financial expenditures. This continued until Emperor Shen Zhang took the throne, which eventually sparked the famous Wang Anchi reforms. These reforms aimed to increase revenue, but they also resulted in political infighting and chaos within the court. In fact, according to Time Magazine's Top 10 Richest People in History list, Emperor Shen Zhang snagged the third spot. Why? Well, it was because of the Wang Anchi reforms, which significantly boosted the imperial treasury's income. One of Wang Anchi's policies was for the government to provide loans and crack down on private usury. By doing so, the government collected interest and increased its revenue. Additionally, other reform measures included the government taking control of commercial trade and forcing the common people to buy goods directly from the government. On the surface, it seemed like these actions increased the government's financial income. However, in reality, it forced people to buy low-quality goods at high prices, exacerbating inflation. Can you imagine the resentment caused by skyrocketing prices and forced purchases? Yikes! Later on, Emperor Zhejiang took the throne, and along came the Yuanyo reforms, which scrapped the new policies. As a result, the government's financial income declined during Emperor Zhejiang's reign. So, to sum it up, when I mentioned in my previous video that Emperor Shenzhong was ranked third on Time Magazine's list of the richest people in history, it was actually due to the Wang Anchi reforms, where the government monopolized the market and profited greatly from commercial trade. During Emperor Shenzhong's reign, the government was swimming in cash, but the common folks were drowning in misery. The lower classes had to endure skyrocketing prices, while the merchant class suffered from government policies that stripped them of their profits. It's great that the government valued commercial development, but taking over the market and monopolizing commerce wasn't such a fantastic move after all. Some people believe that the reason behind the apparent economic prosperity of the Sung Dynasty is simply a case of statistical errors. Yep, you heard it right. It's all about those numbers gone wrong. Now, here's the claim. Many netizens argue that the annual fiscal revenue of the Sung Dynasty exceeded a staggering 100 million tails of silver. Some even go as far as pegging it at a mind-boggling 160 million tails. In comparison, the lowest point in the Ming Dynasty was a mere 5 million tails. That's like comparing a goldfish to a whale. On top of that, if we look at the data alone, the fiscal income of the Southern Sung Dynasty seems to surpass that of the Northern Sung Dynasty and by double the amount. 
It's all pretty mind-blowing, right? But hold your horses. Some scholars argue that the reason behind this misconception lies in a mix-up of statistical units. So, here's the scoop. The misconception stems from assuming that the fiscal income of the Sun Dynasty was measured in silver tails, and then wrongly assuming that 1,000 copper coins equaled one tail of silver. Oopsie daisy. According to these assumptions, the Sun Dynasty's annual fiscal income would soar past 100 million tails of silver, making it the wealthiest and financially most successful dynasty in Chinese history. But here's the thing, the statistical unit used to measure the fiscal income of the Sung Dynasty wasn't in tales of silver or copper coins. You see, during the Sung Dynasty, taxes were collected in the form of goods and currency. It wasn't as straightforward as the later Ming and Qing dynasties, where silver was the main unit of measurement. In the Sun Dynasty, the fiscal income was calculated based on the total sum of various items like copper coins, gold and silver, silk and cotton, grains, and fodder, to name a few. Each item had its own specific unit of measurement. Copper coins were measured in guan, gold and silver in tails, fabric in bolts, grains in stones, and fodder in enclosures, and so on. The Sung history explicitly states that there were four categories of tax items, grains, fabrics, gold and iron, and other products. Grains were further divided into seven subcategories, fabrics into ten, and gold and iron into four. It was a complex system, my friends. Even if we were to convert these goods into copper coins, what price standard should we use? This is a question that even the people of the Sung Dynasty themselves couldn't fully answer. So, you can imagine the confusion. By randomly converting these goods into copper coins using different price standards, it inflated the fiscal income of the Sung Dynasty significantly. And that's why some scholars argue that the data on the fiscal income of the Sung Dynasty may not be entirely reliable. Hey there, awesome viewers. I hope you enjoyed diving into the fascinating world of why some people think the Sung Dynasty wasn't as economically prosperous as it seems. Just a quick reminder that a country's wealth doesn't guarantee prosperity for all periods or its people. If you enjoyed this video on the misconceptions about the Sung Dynasty's economy, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and give it a thumbs up. Your support keeps me motivated. I'll continue sharing my thoughts on Chinese history, culture, and artifacts. Got any topic suggestions? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching and stay curious.